meeting is being uh, videotaped and recorded. It will be shown at some point. Um, I don't see any members of the public, so no public comment. Um, first, like a motion to approve minutes of the last meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Do you all, you all copy this? Is there a need? I believe we have this. And do you have a need to come to a report? Yeah, that's it. Wow. You guys are right here. I didn't actually give them that oh, this yeah. time. They got it the first time. Oh, all right. You got it the first time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, in the short version, Paul knows every meeting, and Paul has probably a lot more meetings than I was in this whole process. But short version is there was an interest from residents on Round Hill to extend the Elm Street Historic District up Round Hill. This has been a discussion for almost two years. Um, I think the residents began the process because they were really afraid of the redevelopment on Round Hill. So for some of the residents, it was sort of fighting something. Um, but the Historic District Commission embraced this as you know, a good logical opportunity to expand the district. We went through the, we did a year study process, we went through the normal uh, study process steps, which are a series of neighborhood meetings, a couple of, of formal public hearings, and more importantly, sort of a detailed study of does this make sense from the character of Elm Street. Um, and the Historic District Study Committee voted a month ago, the dates in the report, to formally adopt this report and to recommend that City Council adopt the expansion of the Historic District. Um, they're not recommending any changes to the existing ordinance other than expanding district. So all the rules that apply now on Elm Street would apply to the new district. This would include um, portions of Smith College going up Round Hill from private properties, the portion of Clark Campus, which Clark is retaining, and then a uh, the portion of Clark Campus, which Opal is acquired. So all those things would be covered. Have we met with any real opposition? No. The reason is, the first year we studied it, this, the, the reason it took another year is Clark was very concerned that if the deal with Opal fell through, it would basically mean nobody could redevelop the property. Because Opal was paying them a lot of money for the property and redeveloping. And they were concerned that if it wouldn't work for Opal, it wouldn't work for anybody. And so Clark's position was they were vehemently opposed until the deal with Opal went through. And once the deal with Opal went through, they're just fine with it. Um, Can I ask you yeah. In terms of opposition, Which has nothing to do with this. And so I, I found it kind of odd that there was no opposition to this at all. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And, and even the traffic, in the process, you know, early in the process, there were dozens of neighbors who came out. Later in the process, there really were six people, it's a guess in terms of the number, who felt very strongly. But, you know, we saw a lot of people. I mean, you know, Jonas, one of the neighbors, Robert Jonas, wasn't it? Yeah. Robert Jonas helped some neighbor meetings in his house, invited a lot of people. And that place was packed with 40 people, 50 people with a lot of yeah. concerns. And so then to get down to really four or five or six people later in the process. And they weren't even opposed. They just, as you said, they were worried about traffic. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm yeah. not sure this will help, but this is the appropriate way to Early on, for the, I mean, it looked like Opal was going to be an bid, but there were a number of bids. We had a number of meetings where a lot of neighbors showed up. And what we did was we put together what were the priorities of the neighbors developer coming in, what did they really want, and it was to preserve the nature of the buildings as much as possible, to preserve the grounds as much as possible, to have less than 100 living units, and we broke down to like you know, 
seven or eight things, so that once opal came in, and in fact, they're not touching any trees, or maybe one or two, they're not, ex they're not changing any of the building, it was better than anybody had expected by the criteria that were developed. And at that point, the attendance dropped down to, I would say, about a third of what we were getting. Um, and the focus became much more on the traffic and the parking issues. I think it's a beautiful neighborhood, too. And I, I, being from the Crescent Street area, I think, this, I think it's a great thing. The, the only opposition, just so you, you get a preview of what I'll be saying at council, the only opposition all in some ways comes from staff, which are worried about the extra work. And so there's a separate proposal, which is separate from this, but they will come back to council at the same time to merge the Elm Street Historic District and the Historical Commission. Which, for the record, which staff? Me. My, my office would staff. So right now, yep. Sarah LaValle staffs the Historical Commission. I staff the Elm Street Historic District. So we're proposing merging those two things together. Both boards have endorsed it. Both boards said, I'm saying it for staff reasons. They don't, they don't jump up and down and say it's their top goal but they have endorsed it. Um, and the extra staffing that having a bigger district entails is more than made up for by merging the two districts. But they're linked in my mind because it's, it's difficult to have new staff responsibilities. You know. I just thought it was important for the camera that it was used for the staff. <laughs> I won't give them to yourself. Before we go, are there any other questions specifically on this? Any other questions? What would you like from us today? Are you just throwing us in? Would you like recommendations? No, this was, this was referred to you and Ordinance Committee. Ordinance won't act until you act. So we'd like you to act, hopefully, in favor. Okay. So it comes back to Ordinance in a week or two, whatever it is. Monday. Monday. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. Is it the case that um, the No. Um, so in the original ordinance, things that were within the public streetscape was specifically exempted. So it was never never included. Then some people on Elm Street were very concerned about that because they thought well, DPW could do these horrible things. And so they, they reached a compromise, which Ned, the hunt that DPW was fine with, which was nothing DPW does requires a permit, but things above a certain threshold, and I have to look it up, tell you what it is, do require consultation. That is they go before the, the historic commission. The historic commission can say it's horrible, and DPW can still go ahead, but at least they have to have the consultation. So the only thing that's required now is this consultation. So that it isn't the, the rumor that I heard about the uh, parking right along Cutter and Siskin and a little further up being you know, trying to be metered and then be, that being blocked by the historic? Correct. It's, it's, not correct. it's certainly not correct that it was blocked. I'm sure that many people on Elm Street who don't like it, and there may be many people on Elm Street who raised it, and maybe even some tried to say this order to stop it, but very correct, the order doesn't cover this. Any other questions? Yeah, this is in its entirety, it's in your ward, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Depends on the details. So um, City Council approved a change about a year and a half ago to reduce the number of people who need permits. So it used to be any window, first of all, anything that's not visible from public way is exempt. It used to be any window replacement had to get a permit from the commission unless it was exactly the same thing. What they've done is they've authorized staff to issue permits for replacement windows that match the old windows. So if it's six over one or you know whatever the standard is then staff can issue those permits. And frankly, it's the majority of activity on Elm Street's window replacement, so usually staff issue. If they want to change the windows, um, so Wellesley Dorm has come before the commission in a week or two, and they're going to change the pattern of windows, then that still has to come before the commission. And you can have, I mean, if, if, it's, if it's a true mullion window, and you want to replace it with the, in, the internal mullions between two panes, is that the same, or is that different? It has to look the same from the street, so it has to be divided inside the glass. It doesn't have to be something that blocks through the air. So you, you can still want, the, the original windows were a series of panes. The new windows are one big pane, but you have the mullions inside. So that's fine, as long as it's inside. But the snap-on stuff, it doesn't so it's stuff that clicks on the clicks. Right. That's not something else. Thank you. 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 Th
Again, the commission could allow it without going to the commission. Yeah. What about installation of solar panels, let's say, on a roof? You're not exempt. So again, many of them aren't visible from a public way. It still goes before the commission. It's not by right. It's not by right. I've gone to Great Pains. Great oh, really? Pains of glass, yeah. On uh, Elm Street to make some of the fancy diagonal windows, such as on uh, 310 Elm, uh, 225, and um, to go to enormous expense to have these manufactured to, uh, to uh, satisfy the uh, commission. So. It can be done. It can be done, but it's it expensive be sometimes. Yep. Uh, I'm voting against this. Okay. I, uh, I, I'm not in favor of expansion of the historic Okay. Are we ready to vote? We have a motion. Move to approve. I can second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. district changes for core, what we're calling sort of the core neighborhoods, meaning the ones surrounding the, the business um, districts and um, Forum Center and so forth and we. Um, so it's urban residential A, B, and C. The four, and so I'm going to talk about them together and I'll go into the details um, as we go through each one. But the fourth ordinance relates to um, relaxing standards for layout within each of those. We sort of have a generic ordinance that says you can't have more than one principal structure on one parcel. And so that's what the, the number 10 item relates to and it really would affect um, building in all three of those zones. So I just wanted to lay that out there um, before I start the presentation. Um, so Can I just mention that um, we have to rewrite that last one to satisfy the city's commissioners. Which is 10. Yes. So if you, if you um, vote on it, you can add the map. Uh, so briefly, I'll just go over the map. The colors, I guess, aren't showing up so great, so we could um, change that for the um, public hearing. But this sort of lime green area is the urban residential A, and this is the leaves up here. Um, and, it, and there's a little bit down here on Bridge Road. There's also some A um, north of Florence Center. And then there are little um, bits around Ward Avenue, um, Childs Park, and um, near the Jackson Street School. Uh, Urban Residential B is generally surrounding Florence Center and sort of in between Florence and Northampton um, centers. Um, and then going out South Street, and then also going out Bridge Street here. And then Urban Residential C is only um, sort of surrounding um, downtown Northampton, so the Central Business District in this darker orange. And then a couple little bits here. This is um, uh, off of uh, Barrett Street. Um, I'm forgetting the apartment complex, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll come up with it in a second, I'm sorry. And then um, off of Hatfield Street here, and then River Run is also urban residential city. Um, so that's, those, that's the map um, for the districts you're talking about. And the, uh, I just want to outline the goals and the purpose for the change to these districts. Um, are to match zoning to what the existing neighborhoods have been built out um, and, and um, laid out, and so a pattern that matches that. Eliminate a lot of nonconformities, which I'll go into a little bit later. Create flexibility for the changing of family structure. If families need to downsize or upsize, they might need to add units to stay in their own home or um, um, alter them in some way. That, the zoning currently doesn't allow for. Um, and a, a 
Another goal is to preserve historic homes that allows people to reinvest in homes that might need a lot of upgrades, but they can't do it unless maybe they can get another unit out of it to offset the cost of renovation. Um, there's also a goal of maintaining that neighborhood character, so being able to reuse some of these homes. This is an example of a house that's about 3,000 square feet, and um, it was on the market for a long time because it didn't meet the minimum lot size for even two units. And um, yet, the people who were, or many people who were looking at it felt that it needed a, bunch, a lot of work, and that the only way to really use it was, would be to add a, at least a third unit. What district is that? That's urban residential C. And then the, uh, another goal is to simplify the ordinance and make um, it easy to, to read and understand and that there's one standard for all uses in um, a district and that you can easily see those listed uses. Did you have a question? Yeah. Explain the preservation of historic homes. Well, it goes back to my comment It's not a historic that, preservation restriction here. No, 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 no. It's more, and I should say, existing older homes. Homes that really need a major upgrades, um, that um, haven't been touched in a while, but it's very expensive to do that, as you well know. Yep. And so in order to recoup the cost, many times people come and they say, I really want to buy this house, but it needs so much work. I can't afford to do it. I need, is there a way I can put another unit in there to rent to offset the cost of the investment that I'm putting into this house. So it's really, it, and so we feel that by allowing more flexibility with going, allowing units to either expand the number of units or contract depending on um, family size or income or what have you, that this would allow people more flexibility to do those things. And then preserve those existing structures in the neighborhood as they were built over the last 50, 100 years or what have you. So no but nothing to do with historic preservation. Can you, can you speak about how that would work? Um, well, it, um, we don't, the zoning currently doesn't allow multifamily, it does allow accessory units, um, but uh, the reduction in um, lot size and frontage to match some of those URA neighborhoods might allow people to, I mean there's not a huge percentage, but there may be some ability to merge properties and then create another building are building are the homes in URA substantially uh, smaller square footage wise than URB or C? The homes themselves? Um, I wouldn't be able to make that assessment, but off the cuff, I would say I think um, generally in Northampton neighborhoods, um, there's such a mix of type of units that you have big houses and little houses, and that's sort of scattered throughout the city. So I don't know that you can make a general. I wouldn't make, be comfortable making a statement saying that one location has bigger houses than another. So URA is not getting those benefits of that nearly as much, except for these possibility of adding accessory to the building, making their house their footprint bigger. They're not getting the benefit of being able to reuse a historic home by dividing it into maybe right. two families. Right. So I'm going to recommend.
discussion, people have raised the issue that if we're allowing this in the other in-town neighborhoods, why not allow more units to be built also in the URA, which are very similar in character to the B districts? Is that the amendment I just sent in? Would you consider that a friendly amendment? Um, no. It's an amendment. Um, <laughs> yes, that's a bit, yeah. The ordinance, so the normal ordinance, obviously you can make whatever recommendations you want. The process, if council wants to add that sort of amendment, is this to have to be re-advertised and start the, start the journey over. You can narrow down the ordinance, but you can't expand it because then the advertising would be The reason I'm raising that as an issue is the last vote, we had an issue that I've been working on for about three years, scores of meetings. You guys have worked on this far more than I have. Lots of public input, and and I, you know, you have a right to vote against it, but you know, make a comment on it. Which, after all this work, it's almost like all of that conversation is that perhaps they thought of some of the things you also thought of, but that at this last moment you're coming in. That's why I wanted to check to make sure if this is friendly or non friendly amendment. And um, I guess when things come forward to us, especially ones that I know about that have gone through multiple hours, scores of hours on this. I guess that's what the times I, I question whether at the last moment somebody jumping in like me or you or Councilor Jason suddenly having all these ideas, I would, I would wonder first if the question shouldn't be, was this brought forward and what were the reasons it wasn't included? Because usually I would assume that after all this time it probably was at least thought of. So that would be my question to you. Was it thought of? And if so, what was the reason that if it was discussed, why wouldn't you have included the concept? Here again, to suggest. Um, I think that um, a lot of, there's, first of all, there's a lot of change proposed here. I'm sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. Um, and um, I think our um, concern was that we're, this is a, this is a big package and we wanted to take it incrementally and that potentially that we would address urban residential A as a separate package at another time. Um, but we first wanted to take this initial step to say let's match the neighborhoods with, the, with what the zoning is on the ground um, and allow more flexibility and then have a much more detailed conversation about A by itself because we but hadn't really. Can I just add, so you're, the reason it was included in both, both cases, you're saying it's a process, goes more a process reason rather than the substance of the content of what the council is suggesting in this amendment. Is that correct? Partially, yeah. It, there's also, I mean, if you look, URC is the area that's a very easy walk from downtown. So that's the area from a density standpoint is most important. URB is, for the most part, not exclusively, a relatively easy walk from either Florence or downtown. Um, URA, frankly, is just weird. There are places in URA which are abutting URC and logically should be URC or URB. There are places which are abutting suburban residential. And so it just it needs a separate kind of treatment to talk about, you know, the solution that the that council is talking about would probably make perfect sense in parts of URA and would be absolutely horrible in other parts of URA. We, just, we haven't had that conversation. This is really coming out of sustainable in Hampton, which is how do you, you know, we're losing density close to downtown, close to Florence, as family size drops. So how do we have the same number of people, maybe more, but probably not, within walking distance of downtown that we did 20 years ago? We have fewer and fewer people each year. And that's not really, that, that's not what this one's about. So we may need to revisit at some point, but it's a general kind of conversation. Can I hear the amendment again? Yeah, let me, let me speak briefly. I've held my tongue on this um, while we've been talking about it. Uh, oh, don't. First, first of all, for, for the chair's um, edification, this was considered and brought up during the, during the meetings. And, and also, um, I really don't think that, and I know we disagree on this, but I don't really think that discussing this in committee is the last minute. Um, we can take as long as we want on this. The planning board will see it again, and they're going to have their official public
way I see URA is, for the most part, what uh, what uh, Director Biden said. It's a hodgepodge. It's a mix, um, and uh, there are parts of it that probably should be changed with a map change. And, um, I'm a. I also believe that we should have a map change discussion uh, contemporaneous with this one. So I don't think that's a negative. zoning things, <coughs> changing the zoning in URA, B, and C, I think we should also be talking about what fits and what doesn't in A, B, and C. But uh, I see the benefits, the, the proposed benefits of these, these changes that um, Mr. just outlined, the changes of uh, being allowing people to use their homes uh, in ways that allows them to some of the equity, for example, by, by adding a rental unit um, that allows them both to stay in their home but also receive some income from it, um, allow them to maintain its uh, character uh, on, the in, on the exterior but uh, change the interior. Uh, I also see it as um, there was the, uh, the other benefit is that we do know that there are grandfathered uses of structures in URA that have more than one family, more than a single family home. So this would bring them into compliance. Uh, so those benefits, the benefits that are outlined, actually miss much of URA, unless we have something that says on page three, at the top, under uses allowed by right, not just a single family home, but something that looks like URB that says single to My suggestion is actually to hasten the discussion and make it part of a larger package, which also includes, could include map changes. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm not going to be around forever, and I'd like to see some of these map changes take place uh, with this zoning package or close to it, and not way later, farther on down the line. Uh, so that's my. I actually remember when Elm Street did not look like it does today, where places were falling into disrepair, many of the homes, beautiful homes, that fell into disrepair. And had it not been for turning these huge houses into multi-families, uh, they would have absolutely crumbled um, years ago. Um, so I, I, With respect to what um, Councillor Freeman Daniels is saying, I have to agree that it should maybe be a map change. And it should be a part of this of this whole conversation. Um, like if we've got URA where it probably shouldn't be, and it should be URB. I know it's it's a huge job. It's not the simplest thing in the world to do. And I understand that you're going to get pushed back from the community, you're going to get pushed back from neighborhoods. Um, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Well, part of the thing I've got all this in my head here, thinking yeah, yeah. about what's gone on in, throughout history. I've been over 50 in being part of Crescent Street, and um, so that's why I bring it up. So a couple of thoughts. One is I don't want to sound like I'm gun-shy, but I am a little gun-shy. So some of this is, there's no question that when we had a much more modest change to URA, we had one of the most controversial meetings ever in City Council, ended up voting it down, where we were going to change some areas from URA to URB. So Ward Avenue, James... Street James Avenue, yeah. um, Hillside. And so there's no question that people can said, you know, we're proud to be a single family home only neighborhood. We don't want to change that. And those are the places that to me were the most compelling arguments. We didn't look at, you know, all the league center, which yes. is URA. So some of that is sort of being gun try whether it makes sense or not. And frankly, I think a lot of it does make sense. I mean, I'm never opposed to, to more density, but it's a bigger conversation to have in the community. So that's one thing. The second thing is, it's hard. I mean, part of what we're trying to get is zoning change in small enough pieces that neighbors can grasp it, can understand what's going on. And if it becomes too comprehensive, you know, everything is tied to everything else, I, I get that. If it gets too comprehensive, people can't really necessarily follow it easily. 
And his appeal to me, at least, is saying, let's create the clear rules for what each of these districts are. And then let's go back and do the map change and say, okay, URC is, you know, what we'd like is a story. Carol and I toyed with changing the names of every district to something that had a story. Um, and we stopped doing it where you had one district that was not in my backyard, so we didn't, didn't go there. But we started playing with, okay, URC, the story for URC is it's the area that's easily walkable for a majority of people. So within that magic half mile area, four tenths of a mile. Um, you are being, you know, so, so trying to get the city council to agree on what the story is, and then going back to the map changes to say, okay, is this area the story that's easily walkable downtown? In case it should be your city. We just finished that litany. You are, I got the URC story. The URB story is the URA story. They can't. That's why they didn't rename it. Yeah. They can't tell the story. Well, you know, I think they can. URB is the area that's, that's walkable, tends to be pedestrian friendly, walkable, is a Practical matter, most people don't walk. So I used to live in your ward in, in, in but the But accessible valley. to the bike path as well. Right. That's URB. Right. So URB, I had a nice walk downtown. I did it most of the time. My wife never walked it. And, and so, the, you know, the majority of people in URB don't walk, even though you could. URA is a point where that's where I can't tell you the story. URA is just, I don't know what the story is. And, that, and that's because there's, it's sprinkled all over. So how do you mean that? So is the notion that eventually you would back your way into a story of A by moving out A, currently zoned A, to B, to B or C? So, right, that, so I don't, that what, what's the I don't disagree the council's goal of all of doing a math change. I don't, I think I'd like to figure out, the, first it becomes too overwhelming, and I'd like to figure out the basic rules first. You are, I mean, you are B and C, if for the most part, if the math works. A, this is weird. Some of A should, I mean, there's a couple approaches. Some of, of A absolutely should be rezoned to B. Some of A probably should be rezoned to suburban residential. And then there may be a smaller core A that remains. You know, Fox Farms Road, the area north of Florence, made it in its perfect sense to be A because, frankly, it was built with the current zoning. And so the homes there do comply. It's all the older areas that don't comply. North Farms Road. Fox Farms. Oh, Fox Farms. Strawberry Hill. Yes. Right. Okay. I, well, I, I, apologies for being late for playing catch up. Um, but I, I think I'm obligated to catch up. So, then can you, can you? Um, we haven't gone that far, so don't yeah. This is like the second page of the presentation. We haven't really yeah. that. Well, I guess I'm, I'm catching up with you. And in, in what, I don't know if it's one sentence of both, but is it, in however brief words, and what you want to do that's different than what they're doing is? Include map changes in the zoning package. And not pass this zone, the zone. Not by itself. Okay. But you initially started by saying amend the text for URA, which was not a map change, but that obviously needs. We haven't got the URC yet. It's, may, I, may, I, <laughs> may I take a crack at it? I think it's more a process question than a disagreement on the content I see. of when to do this. Am I correct? That you guys are saying, partially you talked about being gun shy, partially you're saying it gets more complex, and that's part of being gun shy. It's more difficult. You're saying, I'd like to see this move forward as a more comprehensive package. That, that's kind of what I'm getting. It's not so much, there might be some disagreements about what should be zoned that way. Well, but it's mostly process. And part of the process is we've had a lot of meetings, mostly Carolyn, so I haven't had to go, but over three years of meetings. Yeah. Um, and so we, ha and we haven't engaged some neighborhoods, which we should fit. So the center of leagues would be very much affected by allowing two families. And they were never really part of that table because they didn't expect. Right. I mean, they came to some meetings, but not the extent that you would be And before us, sorry. Uh, before us today is the, is this. This is what we're. I mean, we're recommending. Are we voting on this? We'll be or recommending. We're we're on seven. Four no. or uh, the whole is oh, no, the whole package is seven, eight, nine, package. ten. Yeah. Which are four a series of four ordinances. Three. One one is URA. Two is URB, three is URC, and then a fourth one that sort of is, um, affects all yeah, three. After all. And, and when you say it is these or it's URA, BC, it's defining what ABC is. Right. A new, this is a new definition. This is a change to yes. an old definition. Yeah. yeah. So we're, currently okay. we have a, we have uses in a table, and then we have the financial requirements. Oh, separately. that's right. I so it's merging. It's merging the two tables and creating one table for each district. I see. And then um, um, more clearly identifying what's allowed in those districts and what are the dimensional requirements, the lot change requirements. So there are pieces of it that are 
almost sort of administrative in yeah, that so they're like merging things. And then there are other pieces that are more, more substantive, like design standards and lot size requirements and number and of That's the thing we've been going to meetings on to over right. three years. I just, I'd like to just jump ahead because the same thing, except the opposite applies to URC. Could you say what you mean? Yes, which is that uh, URC, I, would, I, I don't like URA, but URA construction here because actually most of the intended benefits are miss URA unless you have some of this, some of this language change. And um, so that would logically lead to a map change. URC, I think, goes beyond the contemplated benefits to create a uh, density that I don't think that, uh, are contemplated. And so I would not ever vote on the URC rules without a map change. So I think it does, because I, I, believe this is, I believe that these three, uh, this three package with a little bit of tweaking, which we probably will get to, it is a very reasonable, rational reconstruction, a rational construction of walkable neighborhoods close to town, near amenities, and not as close to town, and then other. But um, the, the construction has to ma match the territory, and it doesn't exactly map is old. So you're changing the zoning, you're, uh, you're, mod you're modernizing the zoning, but you're doing it over an old map. And I don't think that's a good idea. Can we, before you ask, can, do, do you want to address it? And this isn't new, by the way. We, we can. No, I guess the question is, do you want Carolyn to run through her presentation first? So everyone, because Owen's been involved in all the discussions, so he's heard a lot of this. Does it make sense to do that so you all get the same point Which would you and then the conversation? And then we've also made changes since uh, originally Owen had raised the issue about map changes, but the staff went back to the planning board to adjust the um, zoning it, it to address like it. sounds like think would be a better idea to run through it. The counselors agree, and then we'll come back and we'll just start off with your, your question or suggestion. Okay, let's, let's go through it. Now. Okay. Is that okay? And then we'll raise questions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I just have this up here. We started this many years ago. I'm not going to go through the <coughs> dates, but you know, initially the sustainable Northampton plan started um, back in 2005, but we had been talking about zone changes since prior to that time. And so we've had lots of public discussion about that. And just go over a few data points. Um, our population has essentially been flat or slightly declining. And particularly the persons per household number has gone down dramatically, especially around the more urban, poor, and multifamily um, neighborhoods. So less than two persons per household, which means there's more demand for smaller units and we're not meeting um, those demands um, close into town. Um, in terms of sustainability issues, we, um, through this process, the Learning Revisions Committee uh, initially looked and did some analysis to, to find and found that 60% and more of the units or lots in the neighborhoods don't comply with the current zoning. So that means that, and this is an example that um, came out of the study for urban residential, um, <coughs> see actually that these X's represent houses that you could, or lots that you could not build today. And so basically when you, when you have a situation like that, you're saying that the policy is we don't think these neighborhoods are good because we think the lot size should be bigger and more units should, or fewer units should be allowed. So therefore, we hope that over time they comply with the zoning. And so I think um, the, it seems that the consensus has always been, no, 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 these are value, high value neighborhoods. We love them. And of course, we would, you know, we want to be able to replicate that. We also have done a housing analysis that shows a demand for more affordable units in sort of the whole range except for the high end range. So it's not just the um, subsidized affordable units, but really the middle of the road units. Um, and, and allowing more flexibility to have units that are close to services uh, re or reduces overall citywide traffic because people aren't driving from outside other areas to get to where they need to go because they're living closer to those places. Um, and of course, we talked about adjusting the zoning to reflect those development patterns. Um, 
in the 70s, um, 60s and 70s, we started clustering affordable housing into, um, this is um, Hampshire Heights actually, and really the historic pattern had been dispersal of units and having a whole mix and eclectic neighborhoods where you've got some multifamilies next to single families and they work very well together. So um, this is an attempt to sort of go back to that. Um, so going over the urban residential A details, um, the green again is urban residential A, so this is the Fox Farms, Strawberry Hill, um, Strawberry Road area. This is Child's Park, and um, here's the rail trail. You can see here that runs between Florence and Northampton anyway, and then out to Leeds. There's urban residential A here around Hillside, um, the backside Crescent, Ford Avenue. There's, um, there's a bit over here by um, Langworthy, and then a little bit out here off of Bryan Road. Uh, so the proposal is to change the lot size to 5,000 square feet with 50 feet of frontage and 40% open mm -hmm. space. Those are, um, right now the lot size is 12,000 square feet and 75 feet of frontage. Um, we still allow single family homes and accessory units. Um, and, we, and, and this would also propose to have one standard for all types of uses. There are some uh, it's primarily a residential district, as the zoning package indicates. There are some other ancillary uses that are allowed, either by special permit or um, by right or by site plan, such as schools and funeral homes and things like that. And then for the first time, we're introducing a basic design standard or design criteria for new construction. Um, and that's um, in the package as well. And they're the same for each district. So the idea is to ensure that that neighborhood character is, is continued even with new construction. Uh, if we drop the front to 48 feet, that would make me conform. <laughs> how many units, I mean, how many buildable lots are for it? Uh, right now? Yeah. I don't know how many buildable are now. If you're talking about reduced, so we did a quick analysis to see if by reducing it to 50 feet of frontage, how many lots could potentially, could you carve off? And out of the total number of units, um, or lots that are in URA, we estimated anywhere between maybe two to two to five or six percent um, of a change of an increase in total number of lots. So it's not that many in urban residential A, and that that doesn't take into account people assuming that people would want to carve off a lot next to their existing house. But we went through and um, did some numbers of that sort. So, so two, let's how many how many lots are in? Um, I have that number on another sheet, which I don't have in front of me. It's in a, I don't know, less than, less than a thousand. So there could say be, six hundred maybe. There could be, I have to, I have to look the number. There could be, so we'll say, let's say eight hundred plus. Yeah, I think I remember the number was like forty-four total units. So there could yeah. be fewer than fifty new yeah. buildings. And that's a, that's a quick, you know, estimate right. sort of based on looking at all of those possible lots and the way you could, you know, carve off 50 feet and still keep your setbacks. And the only thing you can build by right is a single family home, currently the way that right. it's proposed. Right. And well, test requirements always allowed in the this, this accessory would be just, just one question. Should we continue? Sorry, guys. Should we continue with the presentation and then take the questions? So looking more deeply into sort of the urban residential A neighborhood characteristics of the A in the A district, only 65% of all the single family homes conform to the current 12,000 square foot requirements. Um, if the zoning were to change, 99% of those single family lots would, would comply. And so I've got two representative neighborhoods here. This one is in um, uh, Leeds. And so the X's represent houses that don't comply to the current 12,000 square foot requirements. Um, and then over here is, this happens to be Langworthy, so off of Elm Street. And all of these represent, and this is an area that's you know sandwiched between B and C, but again, it's urban residential A, and it doesn't comply to the 12,000 square feet. And then uh, we estimated about 8% of the units in all 
all of the A districts would remain non-conforming because they have two, three, or four unit structures already on them. So um, that's the, um, that number. Just you know, quick background. This is 1974 is when the city sort of modern zoning was born. And it was born in an era of wild suburban growth and thinking that was the right model. So this is about the same time where we had consultants from New Haven who said, well, let's tear down most of downtown and build one-story buildings because people don't want multi-story buildings. They stay satisfied. So URA was originally 20,000 square feet. We rezoned that seven years ago or so to 12,000 square feet, sort of doing an incremental approach. Um, so an example neighborhood that represents what the proposed zoning would, um, how it would be adjusted. This is Ridgewood Terrace, um, Jackson Street School is right over here. This is urban residential A, and most of these lots here, single family homes, they have 50 feet of frontage and anywhere between 5,500 and 7,000 square foot lot size. So that's the kind of, you know, to get a feel of what that might look like, and hopefully some of you, or not all of you, can come on Friday and we're going to try to go to some of these neighborhoods, just sort of, you know, feel it, see it, and be in it um, to understand how these, what these numbers look like on the ground. Um, in urban residential B, uh, 2,500 square feet per unit is proposed for a lot size, minimum lot size. Um, realist, uh, uh, the reality is, it's for a single-family home would be. 3,750 square feet because we have a minimum depth of 75 feet. So with a 50 foot of frontage, that's how you get 3,750. Um, and so for a two family, it would be 5,000 square feet. Um, the open space drops a little bit to 40%. And then we're reducing the front setback to 10 feet because we have a lot of other complicating things in the ordinance that say, well, if you can show your neighborhood has less than a 20-foot front yard setback, then you can get the special permit and go to the planning board and reduce it. So this sort of this would eliminate those special permit criteria, which is actually the thing in 6.8 that's part of this package. It no longer will we give relief for people wanting to build front porches. We're just going to reduce the front setback. Um, also allowing more than one structure on a lot. And, and again, if you're building more than a single family home, you still need site plan review. So this stuff would still go to the planning board to, to, for the planning board to look at neighborhood character and how the new unit fits in or how the expansion fits in or multiple lot, multiple structures on a lot fits in. Um, and that also goes along with the design standards that are proposed, that you still need to build according to those design standards. Um, some urban residential B examples. Um, the current zoning, only 63% of the single families meet the 8,000 square foot minimum lot size. 38% of the two family need it, and 18% of three families meet the 21,000 square foot requirement. So this is an example neighborhood that is comprised of two single and two family units. Um, I believe this is Maynard Street. All these red X's um, represent um, basically, the policy of the regulation saying this neighborhood doesn't work, it should be bigger, or it should be 8,000 square feet, or 12,000, which you can't accept. Yeah. Which street is that? Maynard. Yeah. And then here is an example in Florence, right around Florence Center. I think this is High Street um, and uh, King Avenue. There's um, examples of um, more lots that, that don't comply. With the proposed zoning, 99% of the single families would meet the 3750 square feet, 92% of the two families. So it's not entirely compliant, but it brings it closer. And then 76% of the three families would then comply with a 7500 square foot um, minimum lot size. And we have a smaller percentage in B that would no longer, would, wouldn't conform anyway because they're more than a three family, which is not allowed. So anything above three units, unless you're doing a townhouse configuration, it's not allowed. Um, I also want to note that the, we went back to gradation of number of units per lot size based on the concern from that we heard during the public process about initially we had a flat rate lot size and that open space and parking was the sort of the cap, the thing that would cap the number of units, but. Um, so we've gone back to um, match sort of the similar concept of having a maximum per unit number.
for based on your lot area. So here's some urban residential B examples. Councilor Casey mentioned Elm Street and being able to do multiple families. This large house on Elm Street only has two units in it, um, but it's, I don't know what the square footage, I think Councilor Murphy said there's something around 7,000 square feet. So, and then there's a whole new carriage house in the back that the zoning just doesn't allow any more than what's there. And this house is, um, needs a lot of help. Um, I've talked to the owner many times about how they want it. They need to upgrade the sewer line coming into the house. They need to do all these things, but they can't afford to do that. Um, another example, this is Olive Street. This person actually came in for a special permit to fill in this sort of what we call a missing space on, on, in the streetscape. But she needed a special permit that she could only do it as a connected to family because of the way the zoning currently is. If the zoning were to be amended, then she could, then a new structure could be put on that parcel that would match the um, rhythm on the street of all the houses being, you know, with a little bit of separation between each unit instead of having this huge connected to family. Um, so for urban residential C details, these are the same Let's go back B. to B quickly. Uh, the unit, so 3750 for single family? Yeah. Where is that? Um, well, so that's where it's 2500 per lot, but you have a minimum depth requirement. <coughs> right, I so said that. So 75 times 50 feet of frontage gets you to 3750. So that's the asking, that's the depth in the open space. Depth and frontage. Oh, just, oh, just the setbacks. That's it. Just the setbacks. Just the frontage along the street times the depth gets you to a minimum lot size of 3,750 square feet. Um, but then if you want to do a two-family, then you're sort of back to that 2,500 per unit, which is 5,000 square feet for a two-family. 7,500 for a two-family. So in urban residential C, um, actually the same um, lot size character for six, 2,500 square feet per unit. Again, 3,750 for a single family. Um, and, and the purple area represents the urban residential C surrounding downtown. Um, this is um, Round Hill neighborhood up here. Um, and then lots of the Smith College area here. Um, Aldridge Street, Finn Street. And then out South Street a little bit, or, um, and then east of the railroad tracks on this side. Uh, reduction of the front and side setbacks to 10 feet from 15. Many of the structures already are less than 10 feet. Um, and again, sort of allowing a mix, any kind of mix of units by right instead of um, special permit. More than one structure per lot is the design standards, um, and again, one standard for, for all uses, um, instead of having a complicated structure depending on the number of units you have. So here's um, some examples of current zoning. 61% of the single families meet the 6,000 square foot minimum lot size right now. 14% of two families meet it, only 7% of the three families, 5% with four, and it drops off from there for the five, six, seven, eight units. There are a few of those. Um, this is uh, Aldrich Street, actually, um, in urban residential C, and, the, and Summer Street. All of these represent non-compliance with either the single, two, or three family unit minimum requirements. The proposed zoning, a little bit less compliance in this case, but 90% of single families would comply, 75% um, two family, 46% of the three family would comply, and then just under 50% for four units would comply with a minimum 10,000 square foot requirement. Um, so all of this, actually, um, Councillor Freeman-Daniels mentioned this before, there's still, a, the open space requirement is also essentially a cap in this, in that even if you had 10,000 square feet of lot area, you might not be able to do a four family if you can't provide for the parking for those units. So, uh, because of open space. Um, so in a four family, you need 1,000 square, um, one parking space per 1,000 square feet. I 
should say for all residential uses is 1,000 um, square feet of living area requires one parking space, and there's no more rounding. So if, if we have a maximum requirement of two parking spaces per unit. So if you can't provide eight parking spaces for a four family and keep your open space, then you can't do a four family, you'd have to do a three or whatever the number comes out to be. And that's the case throughout all of these districts. So here's some examples in urban residential C. Um, this is a lodging house now. Um, the owner did a <coughs> building in the back and put was allowed to do one unit, but the zoning doesn't allow more than that, um, even though he has plenty of open space and can provide good parking. And that's, you know, half a block from the post office. Um, this is on Eastern Avenue. I've talked for over 10 years probably with a property owner about wanting to do something to fill in this gap along the street as well, and the zoning just doesn't allow it. <laughs> so again, we <coughs> talked a lot about this, but the, the real goal is to match, as we saw the percentage numbers, the zoning to, to sort of match the reality on, in the neighborhoods, and um, be able to replicate that so that if, you know, there's um, a disaster, then um, you know, whether it's a storm-related disaster or what have you, you don't have to worry about rebuilding within that two-year window, but that we really are saying these neighborhoods make sense the way they are and that you can replicate that. Um, and it's also important, obviously, to preserve the character of those neighborhoods and um, help preserve those older homes um, by allowing the flexibility of reusing those. Um, and allow a sort of distribution of units throughout the city and not just focusing them in one neighborhood or in one um, area where um, it, it could potentially be possible. Council Freeman Daniels had let me know that he needed to leave early, so I wonder if you, if you could okay. if you could have the first question and take the phone. Thank you. Um, I noticed that you are B and A, I, I just, this wasn't something I yard setback may have them, may only have parking for a maximum of two vehicles. That's on your A and B but not C. Um, that standard is not changing from the existing situation. So that's um, what the current zoning <coughs> allows for. Just, I, um, maybe I don't read it right, but what does that mean? It means that your allocated parking, you can only have um, so in the B district, you have a 10-foot front setback proposed. Now it's 20. But in that 20-foot front setback, your driveway can only, or you can only have parking area for two cars. Two cars should really be on the side or to the rear and not in front of the house. But you know, the idea is that you're not parking up the front yard of your property. So that's not a limit. Um, right, I think it's what's retained in your yes. office, but not, but right. not added in your right. I think it says in the case of, you know, in your A and B or something, or every district but C or something like that, you can't have one of the two parking It was places. part of a big discussion with the Board of Public Works also in public safety. conversation was huge. The other thing is you can't have parking within the first um, five feet of the street lot line. So you can park beyond that in the front setback, but not at the front, but it, it gets to that too. 15 foot, so you have other parameters that restrict where you can park in front of your house. So that first you have sort of a buffer strip where no parking is allowed, and then between that and the edge of your front setback, is another so this this came up. We never used to have a requirement for a dozen years ago. And it came up as people had more and more cars, frankly, because more and more complaints about people parking in front. So we added it to, to URA, MTURB, and lower density districts. 
just in fact we could do it to you say that too many buildings couldn't accommodate the parking for the tenants. For new buildings that the design stands for Carolyn talked about where parking is would still would apply to the website. Thank you. So I'm oh, sorry, when you say for new That's buildings, okay. you can't the parking a lot of the parking breaks are not in this package, right? Right, they continue to stay in eight section eight. The one design standard that we've added is design standard number four which says parking for more than five cars shall be distributed on the site to minimize impact. So there's a design criteria related to parking, and that's the same for all the districts. But the other standards that are identified in Section 8.8 .8 for parking have, um, we are not uh, proposing for amendment at this time. And then number, I, I was curious about this, number three, I just made it because I wasn't, Is this enforceable? <coughs> Design standards number three for new building scale massing and setbacks should fit within the block base? Yeah, so basically someone would come to apply for a permit and it would be determined, to, you know, the brand new structure. Someone obviously has to make the call about whether these standards are being met. All of them are appealable to the planning board for review. So if you come in for a structure and I say, hey, that doesn't fit, you don't meet criteria three, you say, okay, well, I'm going to take, I don't agree with you. I'm going to take that one. The other thing is, these things come up most often not, single family homes can often not be built by right, but larger projects typically right. require site plan approval. Right. Can you go and tell me, can you tell me why? map change is not necessary uh, on Henry Street now due to the um, lot size changes? <clears throat> well, um, I think that um, we certainly, there's one person who, or a couple people voiced concern about Henry Street in particular about wanting not to allow any more than X number of units, five number of units, or what have you. But, um, um, and so the area that um, Councillor is talking about is right here. This is the dike. And so there's some, some deeper lots here um, that were of concern. The original lot size, minimum lot size was 3,000 square feet, and you could do however many units you want as long as you're providing the parking. Now with this sort of cap of 2,500 per unit, you could potentially do um, however many, whatever the lot size is. There are also wetlands back there along the back um, of the property, so there are other constraints. But primarily, this is between a quarter and a half mile from the Central Business District. And so, um, given that sort of looking at the bigger picture of urban residential C and creating walkability to those core services and, um, and um, parks and schools and things like that, that from a sustainability perspective, we feel that the urban residential C boundary makes a lot of sense because of the proximity to um, downtown. So I think you know the, the zoning is trying to address that concern and that fear of, of massive influx of number of units there. But um, given the proximity, I think it does make sense to allow some number of units there. It would require planning board approval because anything more than a single family home that's also more than 2,000 square feet requires planning board review. So the board would be looking at it in the context of these design characteristics and the structure that would be built there. It's accessible to open space, obviously. And um, so I, I guess that's sort of the, the planning board's take. Can I just add to that? So it's even the way the central business district is right now, it's within that, you know, the story where your city should be dense. We've been doing a lot of work with some success on sort of moving downtown, down Pleasant Street, creating more options there, from the city taking over Pleasant Street to allow non-street parking, to fix the sidewalks, you know, all those sort of things. So Henry Street will be even closer effective. You know, as, as Pleasant Street develops more, Pleasant Street, uh, Henry Street will be even more in that the heart of downtown. Uh, I mean, there's sections of URB So, so there's no, I mean, it can be, it can be changed, you can change the map to URB. And well, this is B here. Story, right? I mean, I, I think, you know, if we're 
the area right here, to the south of the map also be. Uh, this is all, all South Street, yep. This is um, the uh, Smith College property up on the hill by Lyman, at the end of Lyman. Um, and so this is um, behind Lyman Road, I guess. Sorry, I don't remember that street. Turn around. But yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't really, I mean, I think in terms of boundary, I mean, I, I agree totally that URA is broken. We should be looking at map changes. But I'm not really sure there are substantial changes, maybe crossing both sides of Lyman. But I don't think there's major changes in terms of maps that we'd say yes. This should be URC. It's that easy walking distance. Here. What, what I'm saying is that the, the Henry Street area in the, in the, the, the southern, the yeah. southeastern. Could you point that out? Just Henry Street. Just, Street. I just want to this is, uh, just notice this. is Hockenham this. Road right here, and this is Henry Street. From there to nearest commercial, no, Henry Street is substantially closer. If you're talking about going to the corner of uh, Main and Pleasant, you're right. But I think. As we see Pleasant Street being this big corridor, the Central Business District already comes down to it. St. Holyoke Street right now. The Central Business District comes pretty far down, and I'm, I'm very gratified to see Pleasant Street continue to, to expand. But um, the, if, you, if you want to talk about access to services, it does, Central Business is not the only uh, place where services are required. There's highway business that goes up King Street where you have URB that's just as close. So I don't see that as being. I live right on the edge of, of URC, and I'm closer to city services than anyone on Henry Street will ever be. So um, I, I don't see that as a compelling argument. I do see big lots, deep lots that are bigger than most of the other lots that are in URC. It, it's a different story. I mean, I, you, obviously, you could, you could prioritize whatever you think makes sense. Most people will walk further distances to go to a downtown, where parking is difficult, where there's a lot of stuff going on. So you're absolutely right. Lots of people who live, you know, on Barrett Street are an easy walk to King Street and can get food there. But in terms of the full services that are, are downtown, and the flip side, in terms of providing enough bodies to help make downtown vibrant, then to me that that's why those areas should be there. I, mean, I, I wouldn't have a problem URC going further south along South Street, but to me it's about we should create more density walkable areas. I just want to make sure. Yeah, I. So um, if that yeah, change, which I, I actually move forward um, separately, I guess, um, won't, if the planning to get some uh, map change, then, then I would like to recommend uh, adding to URC, under special permit approval, any multifamily or townhouse greater than six units. So that's an amendment to the yep. Do I hear a second to that? Sorry, could you say again what it is? Yeah, and and what it exactly what it, and what it could do. Well, so our, um, any multifamily or townhouse greater than townhouses, I suppose, would be or greater than six units. Okay. Um, need a special permit. Yeah, so they would be, um, there would be townhouses that would be under six units. What is it currently being proposed in this ordinance that this would change it to? I, I gotta say, I don't know what the current zoning is. But so what this zoning is, is that as long as it complies with units of any size, that townhouses of any number are allowed by right. Maybe Carolyn could answer well, that other question. Except, with the exception of once they get bigger than 2,000 square feet, they need to be reviewed by site plan. I'm just trying to understand what it would do differently than either currently or what's being proposed. So currently, townhouses are allowed by site plan approval. There's no cap saying, well, no threshold saying if you're above the X number, then it's special permit. So right now, townhouses are allowed by site plan in urban residential C. Um, and uh, what's proposed is that townhouses are would also be allowed 
by site plan by the nature that you'd be building more than 2,000 square feet. So essentially the standard would remain the same except that they're now new design standards and layout standards. Um, and as today, the, there is a, the minimum lot size standards um, uh, would dictate how many units you could get on a parcel. And so as the proposed language, there's a cap too based on um, you know, total lot size. So the existing conditions and the proposed conditions are very similar, except we've added some more um, detail about um, review criteria. And um, the total number of units you could potentially get on a lot drop because right now it's one unit for 6,000 square feet versus one unit for 2,500 square feet. Is this a problem? The number you can get on a lot. Right, but the minimum lot size decreases. Right, so that thus the number you can get on a lot increases. So you're trying to address the density. That's correct. I don't think that six units is um, is outrageous or egregious. I think I so you're trying to raise the dead hill. No, to I, no, I think that six is maximum. Is, is no, I don't think it's maximum. I just Without think a special it's, permit. Right. I think it's I think it's a decent that. number. Is there a, has there been a problem that we can continue? So we How have do we to know? test it. So you're just anticipating a potential problem. Well, specifically on him. I mean, like I said, I don't think for most of URC, which I own half of. Uh, for most of URC, uh, I don't see it as being a major problem because um, the planning board and, and the Office of Planning and Development uh, listened to a lot of the feedback that, that uh, was being, was being, they were getting, and they, they adopted a hybrid approach uh, where, where the frontage shrinks. I, I, like I said, I think this is a very, with a little few little things, I think it's a rational very rational construction, but I do think that was in URC with some of the larger lots that are on the edge, and I don't think wetlands has anything to do with it, that, that you should have a restriction uh, that, and I think six is a pretty decent number. So in fact, I, my, many of my residents could, want it below six, so I, I'm proposing could, six. As, could you, let me just play devil's advocate, and why, and maybe, or maybe you guys can, why not go along with this? Well, I think, I guess looking, again, sort of going back to the sustainability issue, I think if we're talking about trying to encourage development where it makes sense, that um, having, um, uh, putting a special permit threshold in front of someone is a real, is a, sort of an impediment. I mean, what we've been trying to do is reduce special permits. The other piece of it is, it's not clear what those special permit criteria or standards would be. I mean, if someone comes forward and says, okay, I really want to do seven units on Henry Street, it's the only lot in this neighborhood that I can do seven units on, but I need a special permit. And then they, they comply with all the design criteria, they, um, the, the way the layout is, fits in with the neighborhood, it's just seven units, but the next door neighbor says, no, I don't like it. You know, I don't know what the criteria would be to say, okay, seven is okay here, but not okay in another neighborhood. So I think there would need to be some clear standards about you know, why you would, why the planning board would say no to something like that. If I could add sort of maybe three or four reasons. One is that Carolyn was saying, if we really mean we want more units closer to downtown, then having units, be, yes, it's nice to relax the standards for existing homes, but if we really want more units being created, it is going to be these larger lots where they go. I mean, for the most part, there's not many places where you could be getting this extra units. So if, we, if we're, you know, whether either it's mapping or making it more difficult, we're saying we want to have these units. The second, from a sustainability standpoint. The second thing is, yeah, with most investors, a special permit's really scary. It's expensive, you put a lot of money at risk, and so you discourage the investors from doing it. So we never, I mean, even if we never, even if the planning board never turns down a project, we don't see the investors who don't come forward. You can ask any attorneys or realtors in town, and they're going to tell you the number of people who walk when they hear something special permit. The third is the city's exposure standard. You know, we are an increasingly litigious society. And site plans get, approved, get, get appealed, and it's pretty easy for the city to defend it. Special permits, it's really easy for not much money to slow down a special permit for three or four years by appealing it. And so it means the people of rich neighbors who don't like a project stop the project. The people who don't have rich neighbors don't stop the project. And 
and to me that's essentially unfair. And then the last point is, if this, if this density makes sense, the problem is you're potentially creating sort of a game for a developer. It's like, okay, I want to do eight units, that requires a special permit, so I'll divide my land up in half and I'll do two four units, exact two four unit projects. Exactly the same density, maybe not as well planned, maybe not as efficient, but it would avoid the special problems. I think people are always looking at how do you see it. Okay. Um, I'm not, I'm not a, a planner, but I play one occasionally <laughs> when, I, I'm, when I'm asked to approve these things, which uh, um, I think as far as uh, activism and attention changes go, Ward 3 has been the one. Uh, and that's primarily because um, URB and A have not had the same uh, problems that, that, that UR, UR, the Ward 3 and some particular <laughs> elements of URC are talking about. I don't possibly, I do not really get how not having, you would use the same special permit criteria that the city uses. I mean, why do we have home business for personal use under special permit? Um, there, there aren't significant criteria listed for why you need a special permit for home business for personal services. They're not there. They're the, it's the same generic special permit uses. I don't buy that. Um, number two, no one, I, like I said, I think six is a, is a reasonable number for a developer to make a good amount of money in converting a single unit to five or six units on a, on a street that, is, that right now has mostly single and two family homes. Um, so yeah, it, it is partially supposed to be a restriction um, or a, a, a scary thing, but it is also partially to uh, force the planning board to say, not generically we like more density in URC, but Specifically, regarding this property, it makes sense to add density here in URC. And that is a question that I think um, you need to spend a lot more time on, and that's why you have a special permit. Uh, and I also think uh, six is extremely reasonable. Higher than six is not, uh, it's not burdensome, and it, it cannot possibly cut into somebody's profit margin when they're going from basically a single or two family house to six units. That's my response. Can I ask you one question? Just on the six How did you come up with the six? I I'm, I'm actually copying. Why not four? I'm copying, but eight. well, everyone wants to hit, everyone I talk to wants fewer. But I'm copying the uh, site pin approval for the creation and expansion of more than six. Okay. So when you say everyone, this has been something, you say this is, in your board, this has come up. That's correct. And these discussions. And it's only the folks in your board have spoken about this and say, look, we'd rather not even have six. That that's, that's right. But I, I also believe that this only applies to it. It's, this isn't like, well, we're not going to be able to get density to, in War 3 or URC anymore. It's really only going to apply to a few properties where six becomes a very, uh, or greater than six becomes a very uh, appealing. Yeah. I have a question about the process. Do we need to vote Assumption we're having a vote. Okay. I think we would like to take a vote. Yeah. Um, I just again, I, know, I have to leave at 6:30 because I, I know we were scheduled for five. Don't six forget, this also goes to ordinance. It also right. goes to council. Okay. Our so recommendation just moves this along. It's not the last shot at this. Um, so for example. Go ahead. No. Okay. So I um I am extremely comfortable with the proposal as. Right now, if we could have just a minute, I'm comfortable with the with the with the proposal. I'm comfortable with the proposed proposed ordinance without the amendment um, for the reasons that were described. And um, I just I you know I realize that we may I, I just feel like I I want to be um, less regulatory, in, in, and I realize this is a risk in that there's a risk in this, but I I'm inclined to to take the risk of being less regulatory and um, posing less obstacles. Um, and if and you know we can always come back. I mean I realize we might be messy, it might be really messy 
that we're coming back in the face of a situation that arises. But I'm willing to take the risk of facing that mess versus the, uh, the other thing we'd be communicating by this whole special permit thing. So I'm comfortable with it as it's currently constructed. I just want to hear from you. Actually, do you have a comment on the event? Uh, no. Okay. So I want to make a comment on the event, which is because it's the counselor's board and they've had conversations with us, I'm going to vote to support the amendment tonight, knowing that then he can come forward to the ordinance committee and say, look, we don't agree with this amendment and put your arguments out. But because it's in your ward, there have been conversations, there have been conversations in the past with the two before you. So also, I, I, I plan to support that. Otherwise, in, I, would, I would vote to support the whole proposals as a whole, except I will support this amendment, which is what we're talking about right at the moment. Um, Councilor, do you want to speak first or hear from uh, no, Caroline? No, I'll just Caroline, go ahead. I was just going to say that um, um, for the amendment, we really have to advertise it because right now we don't have a special permit criteria for townhouse, so it would be a, you know, a more difficult standard that we're introducing, which you know, can be done, but I just want to clarify that that would have to be a separate ordinance it could, you know, go along in parallel or be a little bit behind yeah. or what have you. And it may be that when it comes before and it's before yeah. the city council, I might even change my vote on this. But, you know, but right now, if, if the board council, one of the things we, the places we do listen to our constituents is on zoning changes and lines and open space. And uh, I do know there have been a lot of conversations through the years. But I, you know, again, if you come forward to ordinance or you come to city council and you make those kind of Arguments you may find me or other counselors supporting that. It's just, so, so you're it. not saying that we can't vote on this amendment? I'm saying um, what you could do is you could recommend that this package goes forward and recommend that as part of the package a new ordinance be introduced that, that um, um, requires a special permit for a townhouse number of units. I don't think it's not a new ordinance, we need a new advertisement. New ad, right. So you would advertise the same ordinance with an amendment? Yeah. Right. So one of the things, I mean, if that takes longer, an ordinance or the council could decide to move forward with all these pieces with the understanding that we'll return to this, and it may be that we can work something out with the council and say that there's an agreement that we're going to come back to this and discuss this and restate it. Or we, I mean, the other thing is, the other the other pieces of the ordinance could move forward, so B and A and the other bits right. could move forward, and then C could be re-advertised. And either catch up or go separately. I think that's addressing Councilor Schwartz's concern, which is like on the whole, I even Councilor Dan is saying, oh, look, on the whole, this is a great thing. We don't want this to take months and months more, but just to make sure we address some of these other pieces. Not Councilor takes it. Mm -hmm. it we All of this is more, is this more about conformity or is it more about infill? It seems to be that. I think it addresses both. I mean, part of the part of the analysis was saying, look, we don't even match our neighborhoods. So basically, on a policy level, we're saying these neighborhoods don't work. We need to make them the lot size much bigger because the policy was created in a time where the idea was to just make much bigger, more suburban lots. So, in by adjusting the zoning to match the development patterns and allowing compliance, you're also saying that. Some of that could be replicated. So some people who might have a single family might be able to add a two family now because it matches what else is in the neighborhood. So it, it, it accomplishes both. Just just so we, so we can move away from the whole thing for a second, yeah. if we can address what was an amendment, but it might not be able to be worded as an amendment, I'm not sure from what you said. Can we just address I would like the to support the amendment. I'd like to support the amendment. Um, and are you suggesting we can't move it forward as an amendment? You would suggest that we move it forward in some other form if we do vote to recommend it. Is that what I'm hearing, that as well, an amendment? I think as a board, you could definitely do it as an amendment. I just we want okay. you to know that you know you can't be voted by council until we, okay. we, have, we have to advertise it before we get a public hearing on this piece. So the ordinance would have to rehear that piece, not Monday when they're rehearing the whole okay. package. Yeah. So but, I mean, we could do it as quickly as possible, but, but it would just a process question. Would it be possible to move forward with the whole package? And I'm not sure this would be something that we would be okay with. But then we can then move forward with a separate ordinance specifically addressing the counselor's concerns on this so that we don't have to hold up pieces I, I of I would it. not recommend that. Okay. Uh, for the reason, for the, 
the only reason is that you still have to do, you have to do two hearings. You still have to do two. Right, so in, in this case, it might be that the hearings are staggered, but in the other case, you do two hearings, so. Okay, so for tonight, we can move this forward as, a, as an amendment <coughs> from this committee. Okay. Yes? I don't understand your amendment. You started out with URA and then you went to URC, and I don't understand what you're proposing. Well, I think we, um, I think we uh, called, I think it kind of died, that URA thing kind of died. <laughs> URA did. So would, could you restate the Under the URC current amendment? on page uh, four, under special permit approval required for the following uses, any multifamily or townhouses for the city. I don't want to argue against my position, but I just want to make sure I know what you're saying. Greater than six units or greater or equal to six units? Greater than. Greater than. So six units would not be quite right. Okay. That's, yeah, that's, I didn't say that. keep on saying how six is reasonable, so. Okay, <laughs> all right, that's great. Are we ready to vote on the amendment? I don't know what your amendment is. If I can't write it in minutes, I'm not. Okay, the council will show you. Tend to support the rest of this package, but did Lozano White ever address any of this? Lozano White was moved us a lot towards where we're going, but they never got to this level of detail. So you know, cluster a lot of things in the outlying areas came out of Lozano White study. I think they basically said we should allow more density downtown. But it was a it was an overview. It wasn't really. It was an overview, and remember we did. The, was it specific to anything? The URC district used to be 12,000 square feet. So we've, we've made a series of changes over the last 18 years, making them small and small. And so Lozano White was 1984, 85. Yep, yep. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but they were saying allow a lot more density than you're allowing already, but we probably right. go on beyond. Of course, they, were, they, they talked about infill in 84. Right. So we constantly get these little zone changes for the city council. I mean, they're all the time. Just, it's never any, they go back to what you said. A map change has got to be in the future. I mean, you'd be like Assault on Precinct, uh, whatever that movie was, where you'd be boarded up in the planning office because you'd be afraid that the, the neighborhood was going to come in and take you apart. I mean, I've seen it happen here, for example, you know, when things have been a little bit controversial. Um, but, so it, it, in reality, is there a, is there a map change is that because we continue to do this like yeah it feels like we're sneaking in in little bits you know we're doing right. these little raids on the zone so the I zone. think the, the I mean there may be other things coming but if you look at there's an open is that a land use map in sustainable Northampton and that's sort of our Bible things to look at so it's certainly we have to revisit URA and figure out what makes sense there so there are probably some additional business district expansions so Central Business, for example, was expanded recently further down Pleasant Street. We should probably go even further down Pleasant Street. With that. Um, so there'd be some of the changes coming, but I don't think we're not looking at sort of wholesale math rewrites. 
there's some specific areas. Um, Bridge Road near King Street we should be looking at. Um, but not so nothing huge, but these specific areas. Yes. So, so we get closer and closer to allowing people to, they're becoming, they're becoming more conforming, and, but we're stopping it. I just don't, uh, I, I went right back to what Owen was talking about, the, the, the map change, I think is probably, uh, is pretty important. Right. And, and so it's always, I, mean, I, I think you know, it might be more well received than you might think because it gets more and more confusing every time that we change these ordinances and the zoning. Go ahead. Yes. Um, can I just say that I, uh, um, I, I do, I also am generally in favor of most of this. Um, I think it's a very reasonable and, like I said, it's a, it's a construction of what you are, I think you are C and you are B would, would and could and should ideally look like. So I think it's liberalizing and bringing more properties into conformity. So it's going to, it's going to allow for a greater density, but it will also allow for I think, quite frankly, I, uh, I'd like to take another shot at my URA amendment and maybe this time just say, can we think about amending it not by doing a map change, because I think that's actually worse. I think that's a, um, politically, that is the that is the board of the planning office. Um, can we maybe take a shot at the amendment and say that we amend URA, use of allowed, uses allowed by right, single family and two family. Maybe, can we, can we just make it single and duplexes, basically? Is and that, we would eliminate can the URA and be all URB. No, because URB has multi-family. Has three family, <laughs> has three can, I, can I get a second on that one? No, all right. Well, I don't want to complicate this, but just so you know, sort of a bigger piece of you, Yes, that was on a white, actually. Let me just, one thing, that, that's a relevant question. One is the came out of on a white study is allowing accessory apartments, what people call mother law we now allow them by right in every district in town. But frankly, that was partially a political compromise, that going to two families by right in the entire city, I think was seen as too controversial. So I mean, from a staff standpoint, I don't think we have any objection to getting rid of accessory apartments and just allowing two families by right. I'm not sure, because URA in some places is really the same thing as XR. I think I've, you know, that's the conversation I think in some ways that I think we should have before we did it through just URA is, should we be allowing two family homes to everywhere? I don't have any objection to it, but that's a community conversation. Okay. Let me make a process question. Um, it seems like everybody supports this in general, but there are some still support specific concerns. And two of you, I believe, have to be on your way. I neither want to rush this nor hold it up, and I'm wondering what the pleasure of the group would be. What I would suggest is perhaps we vote on this, but I'm choose to vote on it, be fine, because some of these, like, um, Councilor, your suggestion here could be brought forward, both in terms of, you might even convince me on this one, um, before the next the council meeting, or brought before ordinance, if it's okay, but I'm Thank fine uh, holding it up. You know, um, I didn't get a second on that small amendment, uh, so um, I, I can, like I said, I've, I left this over, and I've been involved, and I'm pretty comfortable. Just so want to make sure that you don't feel anybody feels rushed on this, but I also recognize that we don't meet again for a month, and if we could move it forward, fine. But that this this is not finality here. I mean, this oh, no. is we just report. Ordinance committee is seeing it as an official public hearing Monday, yep. and then it would go to um, you know after that um, come back to city council. So yep. no. And I just want to also address in terms of the, your question about sneaking things in and this, we've been seeing tons of ordinances. The idea was when the plan was adopted, there's sort of two approaches. One is hire an outside consultant, pay them right. a ton of money and do everything at once. And then yep. you have this big volume to try to filter through. Or do a piecemeal, less money, but it takes a lot of time because they're doing little business. And, and, and the reason for it, that I even mentioned it was because we have done so many studies with Zana White Commission 2020 stable. We get all these studies sitting on the shelf, and the, the consensus is, well, what are we doing with them? You know, we just pick out pieces of each one of them here and there, and we use them as a matter of convenience. Well, that's what they're there for. Right. I mean, that's what they've been done for. We're trying to get, we, we take pieces of these studies that we 
we like and we try to fit them into our zoning. So I, that's why I brought that up, because that's what I hear constantly. So you yeah. have one counselor slipping out the door and another one I know yes, is... I would like to move this uh, okay. question. So can we move the question? I'm going to move 7, 8, and 9 as a group. Because I don't think, I, I mean, I might be willing to vote against 7, but since it's combined with 8 and 9, I don't know. 7, 8, and 10. 9, and what about 10? Oh, yeah, 10. Well, 10, we had to get it. We as well. Did we get a 3 from the 10? What's that? 10 is the one that allows more than one structure on a parcel, but it also eliminates the front porch special permit criteria or the front setback deduction because um, that's sort of a patch on the zone. It brings everything into me. Yeah. 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 Therefore, I feel, I feel educated, educated right now fully on the section 10. You can't do 10 without. You, you can't do 7 8 9 without. Okay. 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 So, so we're doing 7 8 9 10. Is that correct? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? All right. Thank you very much. Motion to adjourn and consider the lesser submissions. Oh, no, we have one more item. We have one more item. Oh, consideration of cancellation and reschedule. Um, what, what meeting will we consider to cancel? The July? August 7th. I mean, August 6th. I will be gone on the 13th of next week, but I could do the following week. This is in August. Well, if you go that late, then you're almost to your September. Right. I, I, yeah, I'm away to 6 then, actually. You have meetings coming up on July 2nd, which is yep. very close, close to the 4th. I don't know if any of you have plans. And you have August 7th. Right. If you start getting later into the month, we're running into difficulties with other meetings and rooms booked. And, um, I think so it's just I think give your orders. discretion, but uh, uh, I also will not be going to Okay. But they're going to leave, leave it to my orders. discretion and we can yes. discuss this tomorrow and we yes. can discuss what we should do. And it might be that we skip the August meeting. That's a possibility. That's what you're supposed to do in the summer. You're supposed to cancel the meeting. So, so are you okay, culture. Mary? You and I will discuss this and we'll figure out what to do. Okay, well, we'll learn it. Well, here's the thing. If you don't want to cancel the August 6th meeting, then I have to say that I won't be here and you can report it or take right. your so, comment. Yes. Yes. Duly noted. Duly noted. Okay. You are away. Okay. Now I will take a motion to adjourn.